Good morning, precious saints. Welcome to the World Challenge Chapel. For everyone watching online or on YouTube, thank you so much for being with us today. If you'll get your Bible out and turn with me to Matthew chapter 10, today we're going to deal with verses 34 through 42. And this message is titled, The Dividing Line of the Gospel. The Dividing Line of the Gospel. Matthew 10, 34 says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves his father or his mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves his son or his daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person, because he is a righteous person, will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. And brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Lord, we renounce our preconceived notions, Lord, about what it means to follow you, things that have been indoctrinated our minds, things that we have caught and been taught, Lord, that are not explicitly from your word, Lord, even well-meaning people who have passed on traditional views of the gospel and, and of salvation and of Christian discipleship, Lord, that are not reconcilable, Lord, with your words. God, forgive us for that, Lord, and help us clear our minds, God, and clear our hearts that we would receive your word, God, that we would be changed by it, Lord, that, that we wouldn't be drawn into the wicked perversions of this world, those that seem good and those that are obviously evil. Lord, I pray that we would be disciples, God, who count the cost, Lord, who are willing to draw that decisive line in the sand first for our own lives, but God also as we proclaim your truth. Let us not proclaim your truth in a half-measured way, in a half-wheeled way, in a lukewarm way, God, that suits our own compromise, that suits our own shortcomings. Lord, let us set the bar as high as you have set it, Lord, and let us pray that your Spirit would empower us to be like you, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. But God, change our hearts so that we love the things that you love, God, that we mourn the things you mourn, God, that we hate the things you hate, that we would be like you, that we can be your witnesses and even a replication of your image in this earth, God. Use us, use me, use the people under the sound of my voice, but first convict us, change us, Lord, that we might be like you. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the clearest evidences that you are a true disciple and follower of Christ is the willingness to forsake everything, including your own family, if necessary, to follow Jesus. Jesus makes this point very clear, and he uses different examples, and here he uses a sort of example of war and peace and the sword. Jesus didn't come to bring peace in the way we think he did. Listen, Jesus didn't come to unify all people. Why can't we just get along? Listen, there is no unity outside of the truth. The call for Christian unity is unity under the promises, commands, and the very words of God spoken through the law, the prophets, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the apostles. 
Jesus did come to bring peace, but that peace is of reconciling the hearts of men to God. And for those who see the overshadowing value of being at peace with God, they will be willing to be at odds with anything and anyone else for the sake of being at peace with God, for the sake of being right with God, for hungering and thirsting for righteousness that God fills us up with through Christ in his gospel. The ultimate peace of God will be established by his sovereign power when he puts everyone who opposes him underneath his feet as a footstool and he brings everyone into him who has been called to be part of the body of Christ. But this doesn't characterize Christ's first coming. This is more about the second coming of Christ. Until Christ returns, we are sheep among wolves. We live with an internal peace as the fruit and evidence that the Spirit of God lives with us, that we are at peace with God because of what Christ has done. But very often, this will put us at odds with those who are not at peace with God, those who don't fear and tremble at His Word. And this, my friends, is the offense of the cross. This is the dividing line of the gospel. R.C. Sproul is quoted as saying, As many Jews in Jesus' day thought the coming of the Messiah would bring political peace and material prosperity, so many in the church today think that Jesus' presence will bring them a kind of tranquility. But Jesus insisted that his mission entailed strife and division. Prince of Peace, though he is, The world will so violently reject him and his reign that men and women will divide over him. Men and women have been dividing over the issue of Christ ever since he came into the world. Everything about the history of the world is divided between the coming of Christ, the life of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. Even history itself is divided before the things that came before he came to the world and the things that have followed it. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the dividing line between life and death, heaven and hell, being in the body of Christ or being the footstool of Christ. The shallow idea that you can somehow be a Christian without being a follower and disciple of Jesus is shattered by the words of Jesus himself in this scripture. The sad part about much of Christianity today in the West that is popular is the idea that you can somehow be saved by Jesus and have a degree of fellowship with Jesus while believing and living in ways that are in opposition with what he taught and who he was. I'm here to tell you that there is a price to follow Jesus. And I'm also here to tell you that it's completely worth it. People who debate whether or not it's worth it, hear me, they don't know Christ in a saving way. If you don't see him as the treasure of all eternity, if he in fact is not a treasure that was hidden in a field like Matthew 13, 44 says, and that when you found him, when you, when you actually, your eyes were open to who he was and you became saved and reborn in Christ. Listen, if you don't see him as a treasure that outshines everything else in the world, you don't know him. Hear me. You don't know him. The Jews of Jesus' day expected the Messiah to immediately come and deliver them from Roman oppression and usher in an eternal kingdom that would be marked by peace and blessing. They all expected to be a part of it as well because of their ethnic heritage. What they didn't understand was that the only people who would be part of this kingdom were those who were reconciled to God through Christ. 
the Messiah, listen, the, the, the Savior of the world, the Savior and King of the Jews, who is actually the Savior and King of the entire world. The disciples might have thought that because they had experienced and come into the presence of Jesus, because they were following Jesus, they might have been tempted to believe that the world would somehow fall at their feet as they proclaim this message. Early on, they might, they might have thought that because they had the, the call of God and that Jesus had sent them out with his spirit to perform signs and wonders and to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom, they might have been tempted to think this is going to be easy. But Jesus wanted to prepare them to understand that their own people, the Jews, would reject them and that much of the Gentile world would reject their message because they were rejecting the message and the mission of Jesus Christ. Everybody talks about some God. Pagan religions talk about pantheons of gods or many gods or all roads lead to God. And within false religion, even that has a form of godliness but actually denies the power of the gospel, listen, they talk about God too. The Pharisees talked about God. Listen, the, the scribes and, and the Zet, like they all had a view of who God was. But the evidence of were they really seeking the truth of who God was, was revealed with how they responded to Jesus. And hear me, it's no different today. How you respond to Christ, the, the God who took on flesh, the very image of the invisible God says what you really believe about God the Father. Being a true and devoted follower of Jesus will cause conflict. It will cause conflict with society. It's going to cause conflict with the government sometimes. It's going to cause conflict with your human relationships. Because people who aren't at peace with God aren't because they're at peace with a fallen world. They will reject the offer of peace from a holy God because they don't want God. They don't want a Lord in their life. They don't want to change their life. They don't see the value of the treasure. When we present Jesus and his gospel biblically, that's the caveat because there's many, many people who present versions of Jesus and present half-truth gospels and present part of the counsel of God's word. And some of it twist it because that's what they've been taught to do. And some of them do it intentionally because they don't want men to speak poorly of them because they want to fill their churches. They want to they have all men speak well of them. When we present Jesus and his gospel biblically, fully and accurately, when we talk about the kindness and the severity of God, like Paul tells us to consider in Romans chapter 2, when we say things like God will be glorified in the salvation of those who are saved by trusting in him through faith and following him, but God will also be glorified when he sends those who reject him into eternal condemnation and punishment, people say things like, well, if that's how God is, I'll never worship him. I'll never worship a God like that. And my response to these people is, you are exactly right. You will not worship God because you are judging God. People say, if that's what the Bible says about God, and if that's who he really is, then he's not loving and he doesn't deserve my worship. This is what the Bible actually says. The Bible says you're right. You will not worship God. You will not surrender to God. This is what the Bible says about you. And this is what the Bible says about people who reject him. You're rejecting him because you don't want Lord of your life. That's why. We don't come to God to tell him what is just, true, and loving. We come to God to find out what those things mean. If God is God, then we should never think that we can judge him, his intentions, his fidelity, his justice. We are crooked people. We are stained and warped by sin. 
And those of us who acknowledge that, those of us who come to the realization that there's something wrong with the way I've been lording my own life, the way I've been leading my life. I can't find fulfillment. I can't find satisfaction in drugs, in fornication, in immorality, on the internet, in in my career, in alcohol, in women, in pursuits. I can't find satisfaction. I'm empty. That person realizes that maybe there is a God who made me (laughs) and maybe he made me for something other than what I've been living for. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's the acknowledgement that you aren't the Lord of your life. It's the acknowledgement that God is God. And if if in fact that is true, then we don't determine whether or not God is good. This is the question everybody likes to ask. It's the popular apologetic question. Is God good? But the most important question we can ask before we ask that question is, is God God? Is the God of the Bible actually God? Because if he is, it doesn't matter if he's good or not. But here's the good news. He is good. He's so good and he so loved the world that he sent his one and only son to die for you, to die for me, that we shouldn't perish, that we shouldn't face condemnation, to save us, to change us, to make us like him and to make us co-heirs with his son, to love us eternally as we worship him eternally. When you judge God's worthiness of worship based on some flawed human understanding or some flawed standard that you try to superimpose on God, you prove that you don't know him and that you are not being saved by him. This is why Jesus said, Do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. The gospel is a sword, not a plea. It's not an invitation. It's an ultimatum. And that's why the true preaching of Jesus and his gospel often causes offense and division. Verse 35 and 36. For I've come to set man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. This language is meant to draw clear lines in the sand regarding the level of commitment that one must have to follow Jesus. Jesus gives another vivid picture in Luke's gospel that's very similar to this. Listen, Luke 12, 49 through 53 says, I came to cast fire on the earth and that it were already kindled. I've come, a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it's accomplished. Do you think I've come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on, in one's house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. The Greek word diezo, which is translated both in Matthew 10 and in Luke 12 as against, is only found in the New Testament. And it means to cut something in two to rend asunder. It means completely to separate something from itself. Often this means permanent separation of something. Not always, but often. Matthew and Luke's gospel tell us that a few who wanted to be disciples, they said they wanted to follow Jesus, tells us the story of a few who said they wanted to follow him, but they wanted to do it on their terms, during their time frame, in their way. Some of them wanted to prioritize family commitments or allegiances over following Jesus. One person said he wanted to wait so he could receive his inheritance. The other because he wanted to get his affairs in order. 
And Jesus tells us that these half-hearted responses will not be accepted. Brother and sister, it is all or it is nothing. Luke 9, 57 says, As they were going along the road, some said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Well, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So if you're going to follow me, realize it may not be an easy life. You may not even have a place to sleep. Verse 59, it says, Another said to him, Follow me. But he said, Lord, First, let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first go say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Hey, I just want to, this is my family, don't you understand? It's my job, come on. You really don't expect me to put these things above you. Not only does he, but he demands it. Like if you don't see him as worthy of doing those things, you don't see him as God. And if you don't see him as God, he is not the savior of your soul. It's that simple. We want eternal life. We even want to follow Jesus sometimes as long as we can do it on on our own terms. But you cannot. Listen, the disciples who followed Jesus, many of them made many mistakes. Many of them were, were, were being sanctified and changing. I mean, Peter wanted you know, to, to sit on Jesus's right or left hand. Uh, John wanted to call down fire from heaven and consume God's enemies. They were mixed up about a lot of things. Their theology had to grow. Their, they had to be conformed to the image of Christ. But hear me, they followed him. And even when one of them had a, a brief moment of feeling like they had fallen too short by their denial out of fear, Jesus found him. And that man followed Jesus for the rest of his days followed him to a cross where he was crucified upside down. Verse 37 says, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Hear me. I'm not saying that these relationships aren't important. That's why Jesus is bringing them up. It's not saying you should be a bad parent or hate your wife or, um, you know, abandon them or anything like that. It's saying that you're going to make this the priority of your life and let the chips fall where they may. It's going to start, if you're a parent, by you raising your children up in the admonition of this. But if they reject it and go their own way, you don't follow them. You stand firm and cling to this, praying that they're a prodigal who will come back to the father's house one day. Listen, if your mother and your father persecute you for the sake of the gospel, you don't say, well, it's my mom and my dad. Listen, you're supposed to honor your father and your mother, and you should do that in every context, but you shouldn't deny Christ for their sake. Sometimes it's not this cut and dry, though. It's about just surviving. It's about getting by. It's about not being the weird one at Thanksgiving dinner. It's about not being the one that they don't want to see at Christmas. If I'm just quiet, if I just don't tell them the truth, if I just stop talking about the exclusivity of Christ, maybe my life would be easier. And Jesus is saying, if that's you, you don't know me. You're not my follower. You've got to prioritize me above everything else. And here's why. Because it's first and foremost for the sake of your own soul so that you might be saved. But secondly, it's so that you are a witness to all the people around you that you actually believe the things you're saying. I follow God, and he comes before everything else. These are the most intimate and important relationships you have in life. And Jesus is saying this because he understands that this is going to be the line, the dividing line that some people aren't willing to walk across. And he's saying, if you're that person, you have no part with me. You're not worthy of me. I know this might sound like a hard message, but it's important because Jesus said it. And we've got to make sure that we understand it. He wanted his disciples to understand it. And we are his disciples. He's talking about the most intimate and important relationships you have in life. 
Jesus saying, if they cause you not to follow him or they cause you not to prioritize him, then you have no part with him. Your closest earthly relationships, your life, your hopes, your dreams, your place in society, if you hold anything above Christ, you don't have Christ. You don't know Christ. And like the scary words in Matthew chapter 7 or Matthew 25, you might say, Lord, Lord, but he says, I don't know you. I don't know you. To know him, to be known by him. B.B. Warfield said something so powerful about this division, about this uh, dividing line of the gospel. B.B. Warfield said the intervention of Christ to bring salvation to lost humanity caused a rift, a great divide that will never be reconciled. The only thing that can change is what side of that chasm you find yourself standing on in the end. This rift, this division of light and dark, this division of two kingdoms, this division of salvation and condemnation. Listen, this ain't going away. It's not getting better. It's only going to get worse. It's only going to get wider. It is permanent. There's only one question. What side of the chasm will you find yourself on? Will you find yourself in unity, in salvation, in glory with Christ, or will you find yourself having rejected Christ? But have no illusion. It's not going to get better and better. The offense of the gospel isn't going to get less offensive. It's going to get more offensive. The problem for some of you is you never knew there was an offense to the cross because you were told that evangelism was telling people Jesus loved them and by doing nice things and by being nice. Listen, you need to be nice, but not at the expense of the truth. Thou shalt be nice is not the 11th commandment. It's not the third greatest commandment. Loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength is the greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor like he's you, and there's no way you can love your neighbor more than by telling him that there is a chasm, and those who are on one side of it will be saved, and those who are on the other side of it will be damned forever. There's nothing more loving than that. There's nothing more loving than telling people about Jesus. There's nothing more loving than showing an enemy that you love him because Christ loves you. It's about doing good deeds, but that's about this much of it. The most important thing you can do is to live and proclaim the very words of Christ unashamedly, boldly, and as if you are a convinced witness and follower who is a disciple of Jesus. The phrase that Jesus says, is not worthy of me, implies that Christ deserves our entire life, our dedication. He deserves our worship, our allegiance, and our love. If we're not willing to fully surrender to him on his terms, he will not accept us. That didn't sound like all heads bowed, all eyes closed, dim the lights, play the keyboard. No one ever has to know. Don't be embarrassed. Nobody's going to know. Just repeat this prayer secretly. Let's all do it together so no one's embarrassed. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I'm just saying there has to be some point where you stand up and say, listen, I'm being saved from condemnation. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because you actually believe it's true. The confession of your mouth doesn't save you. The confession of your mouth is evidence that you believe something in your heart, that you're willing to confess it with your mouth. You're willing to be counted among Christ's disciples. You're willing to be scorned, ridiculed, mocked, and suffer for his name that you might participate in his resurrection. Verse 38 and 39, it says, whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The meaning of what Jesus is saying would have been abundantly clear to the people of his day. The horror of Roman crucifixion was 
an excruciating, shameful, and drawn out, painful way to die. In fact, the word excruciating actually means unimaginably painful like crucifixion, excruciating. It's an undescribable pain. It's the worst possible way you could die. It's painful. It's slow. It's shameful. You're hung out in front of all people to see. They get to watch you die and struggle to breathe and choke and, and, and just die slowly. It's so painful. Many people who are crucified would, would plead for them to kill them so that they could stop the suffering, being nailed with your hands and your feet to a piece of wood. That's why the Bible says, cursed is any man who hung on a tree. And that's why Jesus was hung on a tree, to take our shame, to take our pain, to take our sin and their consequences upon himself so that we can have freedom so that we could have life. He is the propitiation for our sin. The symbol of the cross to the people Jesus was talking to symbolized excruciating pain. It symbolized heartless cruelty, and it symbolized death. It was meant not only as capital punishment, but it was meant as a deterrent to insurrection and rebellion against the Roman Empire. It wasn't just you got to die for, your, for what you did. We're going to make an example of you. This is a warning to anyone who would rise up against the kingdom of the Romans, the empire of the Romans. And that's why it's so profound that Jesus is saying, listen, we're going to die to this world, the empire of this world. Do not love the world or anything in the world, John the Apostle says. He says, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. These are the lust, or the love of the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Listen, anyone who loves these things, you have no place with me. But he says, those who do the will of the Father will abide forever. This is the great exchange. And Jesus is saying it starts with death. A few years before Jesus spoke these words, a zealot named Judas, not Judas Iscariot or the other Judas, but a a insurrectionist named Judas. It was a popular name during these times. A zealot named Judas gathered a group of rebels to try and rise up against the Roman occupation of their land. The Romans easily put down this rebellion and this insurrection. And to teach the Jews a powerful lesson, the Roman general Varus ordered the crucifixion of 200 Jewish men. And their crosses lined the main roads of Galilee for several days as these men slowly and painfully died before the eyes of their fellow countrymen. Now you're preaching as a Jew to Jews who are hung on crosses by the oppressor, the Romans. And Jesus is saying, if you want to have a part in my kingdom, it's going to have to be as extreme as this. The allegiance you have to me is extreme as this. It's as final as this. You've got to die so that you might live. Jesus' disciples understood that the call to follow Jesus was completely giving up their lives in surrender to his lordship, even unto death. The call to follow Jesus means the same thing to us. I'm here to tell you today that, that the call of being a disciple of Jesus is the same today. It's not about your best life now. It's not about 12 steps to success. It's not about all the things that false religion, false teachers, word of faith, Christian television, Christian books tell you. It's the words of Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I need you to hear it because many of you don't know it. Many of you don't want to believe it. I'm not trying to make it a hard message. This is the gospel. 
This is the dividing line of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus also makes it clear that sacrificing our lives, hear me, that's, hard, that's the hard part. That's the tough part. It's, it's dying. But it's not dying for no reason. It's dying to self and living for Christ, living in Christ, and having eternal life because of Christ. Jesus makes it clear that sacrificing our lives to follow him, it's not for nothing. It's an exchange for eternal life. It's an exchange for freedom. It's an exchange for the chains of bondage of the sin that bound you to be eradicated from you. It's an exchange for something good. It's earthly treasure for heavenly treasure. There is no comparison regarding what we receive versus what we lay down. We are exchanging a broken, weak, and temporal life that is quickly fading away, quickly passing away for a resurrected life that's free from sin, that will never pass away, that has an eternal, an eternal unexplainable peace, that has unquenchable joy, that has unending love in the presence of the one whom we love, the one who loves us, the one who is love and who is light and who is life, the one who died to share his immeasurable treasure with us. Jesus says in verse 40, whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Now here is the gift of the gospel passed down through the ages. If we receive the faithful message of the apostles as revealed in scripture, we receive the same Christ they did. We received the same promises they did. We received the same blessing they did. Anyone who receives Christ, listen, receives the Father. If you receive Christ, he receives you. And he says because of that, his Father receives you. Because you received the one who sent him. And this is the pattern of Christian discipleship and gospel proclamation down through the ages of the church. Christ gave this message to 12 apostles. He raised them up. They wrote the scripture. He sent them out. And he tells them in the gospel of John, listen, not only you will be saved and blessed by this message, but anyone who receives my words from you. And the gift goes on, and the gift goes on, and the gift goes on. It's glorious. And now we are those ambassadors proclaiming the same message, presenting the same Christ so that people might be reconciled to the same God. So if we faithfully proclaim the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ, those who receive the message are saved by the same Christ who saved us because we are his ambassadors and they become saved and they become his ambassadors and this goes on to the end of the age. There's no such thing as believing in God the Father but rejecting His Son and everything the Bible says about His Son. Hear me, Jehovah's Witnesses. Hear me, Mormons. Hear me, false believers. Hear me, oneness people. Hear me, the way that Christ is presented in this word. I just said a lot of different groups. So I'll probably get a lot of different emails. Praise the Lord. There is no such thing as believing in the God of the universe, God the Father, while rejecting his Son. Hear me, you don't have any place at the table of the Father if you, if you reject the bridegroom. The only way you're getting into the family is by being married in. You don't get the benefits of the Father without being married to the Son. Or another analogy that's used, you can't be, uh, have the love of the father unless you're adopted into the family. And the agent of adoption is Jesus. We are his children. We are the bride of Christ. Because of this, we are foreigners. We are exiles. We are sojourners. We do not belong here. We are heading towards a city whose builder and maker is God. And we are trying to take as many people with us as we can. 
Jesus rebuked the unbelieving Jews of his day because they claimed to know God and they claimed to love God, but they rejected him as he stood in front of them. In John chapter 8, verses 18 through 20, it says, I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. And they said to him, Therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Those words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. You don't know God. You don't know God because the Son of God, God who took on flesh, the image of the invisible God, the one you're supposedly waiting for, the prophets prophesied about me. They said all these things about me. I fulfilled all of them. I'm doing the very works of God and you're rejecting me. Why? Because you don't know God. Get down to John 8, 42, verses 42 through 43. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It's because you cannot bear to hear my word. Listen, this is not just true of the Pharisees. This is true of many, many people who claim they know God today. Those who are false Christians. Those who claim to be spiritual but not religious. Those who have... A sort of a compartmentalized view of God. Those who vaguely believe they can follow Jesus, but Jesus is really just their co-pilot or some sort of religious consultant that helps them out from time to time. Back in Matthew 10, verse 41, it says, the one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. Receive a prophet, receive a righteous person implies that you are receiving their title, their their mission, their message. Like if you're receiving a prophet, you're fully receiving him. Not like, oh, he gets things wrong sometimes. He's confused about other things. It's not like that. It's saying you're receiving the message he comes, the name he came in, who he is, what he represents. The same goes for preachers today. Listen, if, you, if, you, if we believe the same word, if we have the same fear and trembling and reverence for God's word, you don't have to be the, a preacher or a pastor or an evangelist. Listen, we are the commissioned ambassadors who are coming, who are, whose lives are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, like Jesus says that he is the chief cornerstone of. This is Ephesians chapter one and two. But this is the idea that we are, we are messengers of God, but not all of us. Listen, we're all witnesses. We're all supposed to evangelize and share our faith, but not all of us are uh, the prophetic utterance of God's word. Not all of us are preaching. Not all of us are teaching. But it's saying, listen, if you, if you accept them, if you accept a righteous person, if you accept a prophet, you have share in their reward. It's not just the prophet or the preacher who will be rewarded for their faithful preaching but also those who receive them, who support them, who stand with them. And this is true of every Christian or a righteous person. Saying the reason is because we represent the same Christ. We're being persecuted for the same message. Verse 42 says, And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple, Truly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. And finally, if you take care of, support, stand with, feed, finance, even give a drink of water to one of these little ones. What is a little one? Who is a little one? Well, it can mean a disciple who's new, a new believer, a new convert. It can mean seemingly insignificant servants. There are people that aren't famous. There aren't people that aren't well-known. There are people that are standing on street corners preaching today. I know many of them. I I love standing there with them. There are people that are doing the work of the kingdom of God as God outlined and commanded in his word. 
insignificant little ones by the world's uh, summation. But it's saying, listen, if you, if you help these, even if you, to the, to the extent of just give them a cold drink of water, because they're a disciple. And Jesus already defined what a disciple is. Not any person who claims Christ. We're talking about true believers, true preachers, true religion, people who stand firm and proclaim the gospel, who draw out the dividing line of the gospel, the chasm, the offense of the cross, and preach the whole counsel of God's word. In other words, there are no meaningless or small jobs or small people in God's kingdom. You will endure the same scorn, the same shame of the preacher, the teacher, the pastor that you stand with and support. I'm not talking about putting these men on platforms where they're above God's word. I'm talking about people who have submitted themselves into the authority of God's word who are filling these places that God has called them to. Listen, you may not be the pastor of that church, but you might get some scorn for attending that church. You will endure the same scorn and shame as the preacher, as the teacher, as the evangelist you support. If they are truly biblical men, great is their reward in heaven, but so is your reward. Because it's saying that if you support a true prophet, a preacher, a proclaimer of God's word, that you will share in the persecution, but you will also share in the reward because we are all sharing in Christ's sufferings so that we might share in Christ's reward. We often look back on men that we consider great men of God. We look back on men like the apostles or St. Augustine, or William Tyndale, who was burned at the stake for for translating the Bible, Charles Spurgeon, John Calvin, John Wesley, the Puritans, David Wilkerson, Leonard Ravenhill. We like and admire them for their courage and their resolve in standing for the truth. But many people who champion the legacies of these dead men would have rejected them if they would have known them in this life. There's so many people today that put up Charles Spurgeon quotes that would have been one of the first people that signed up to have him excommunicated from the Baptist Union, which he was, by the way, because he would not bend on the inerrancy of Scripture. Men like David Wilkerson, who rebuked and wept from a pulpit, who preached the uncompromised truth of God's word. And people like to look back on it like it's a novelty. Like it's, it's sort of neat. Like they like to see the courage, but they wouldn't have stood with him during his time. They wouldn't have stood with, with John Wesley. They wouldn't have stood with, with uh, William Tyndale. There's a lot of people who love William Tyndale, but there wasn't a lot of people standing next to him when they set him on fire. There is a cost to following Jesus. There is a dividing line that the gospel makes. There is an offense that comes with the cross of death. There is a a chasm between the true counsel of God's word and everything else. There's a cost to follow Jesus. There's a cost to preach the uncompromised gospel and the whole counsel of God's word. But to those who are fully convinced of the reward, They will follow Christ over everything else. They will take up their cross and follow Jesus because they have been persuaded of the value of Christ and they have been quickened and regenerated in salvation. And now they are one of God's children. So they live his life. They preach his message. They bear his sufferings. They fellowship with him in his death because they long to obtain his resurrections by any means possible, by any means necessary. The dividing line of the gospel is all about the beauty, the authority, the supremacy, the glory, the exclusivity of Jesus Christ as revealed in the scripture. 
I'm going to close by reading Philippians 3, 7 through 11, one of my favorite passages of Scripture in the entire Bible, really a life verse for me. The sort of picture of a man who thought he knew God as a Pharisee. In the first part of Philippians chapter 3, Paul says, watch out for dogs. Watch out for the Judaizers. Watch out for the false religious. And he says, look, I was one of them once, and I had a great pedigree. I was from a prestigious tribe in Israel. I was a Jew among Jews. I was circumcised. I dotted every I, crossed every T, was raised in the right family, had the right recognition. Listen, he says, I was a Pharisee, and the outside of the cup was completely clean. I mean, like as far as religious observance, I observed it perfectly. I kept the law perfectly, externally. He's not saying he was perfect. He's saying, I did everything I was supposed to do in the Jewish religion. And I thought I knew who God was. I was even killing and imprisoning Christians based on my flawed view of who God was. But one day, Paul met Jesus. And for all of us who are true disciples, this is our story too. Our eyes were opened to who the true God is. All the things we thought we knew about God that never compelled us to live for him, one day that all changed because we saw the beauty and the holiness and the sovereignty and the majesty and the love and grace of God in Jesus Christ. And it changed everything about our lives. The thing that offended us now is saving us. Paul, who had had martyred people and who had persecuted the church, went from the persecutor now to being persecuted because he became convinced. And in Philippians 3, 7, the Pharisee turned disciple, called to be an apostle to the Gentiles, suffering, imprisoned, whipped, beaten, attempted, killed, stoned, left for dead. He says, I had it all together. I was a Jew among Jews, but one day I met Jesus on the Damascus road. And Philippians 3, 7 says, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things. And I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may obtain resurrection from the dead. He thought he knew God. Then he met Jesus. It changed everything about his life. Now he knows him. And he says, knowing him makes me want to know him more. I want to know everything about him. I want to, I want to know it inside and out. I want to know him so that I can have resurrection from the dead. I want to live in resurrection power, but I want to know him in his sufferings. I want to relate to him and have fellowship with him in his death, becoming like him, that ultimately by any means I may attain resurrection from the dead. This is the heart of not a mighty apostle. This is the heart of anyone who truly knows God. This is the dividing line of the gospel. This is Jesus, the true Jesus. You either are changed by him, reborn in him, or you reject him. There's many people who have rejected Jesus who haven't done it with their mouths. They reject Christ as revealed in scripture. They reject the exclusivity of God. They reject many things the Bible teaches, but they still hold fast to this flawed belief that they're they're followers of Jesus, even though Jesus is nowhere to be found. There's no such thing as Christians who don't follow Jesus. If you attend a church where they tell you you can be saved without being a devoted follower of Jesus, leave that church. 
or go talk to your pastor and ask him what he means. If he tells you you can recite a prayer and live in sin and live for yourself and not die to yourself and you can do you, but because you made this open confession of some Jesus that you invented, but you, but you don't actually have to follow him, if that's the theology of your church, you need to have a serious talk with your pastor. You need to pray about finding a church where the Bible's preached and where Christ is proclaimed. I'll definitely get some letters for that. But it's because Christ is everything. He's everything. He's everything. We count everything as lost compared to him. It's not like a, a hard decision to die to ourselves. It's not a hard decision to leave earthly relationships behind. It's not a hard decision to lose in this life, to count everything as lost, because we have seen the surpassing worth of Christ, our Lord, who saved us. And the only ingredient we add, other than the sin, that made us desperate for salvation is the faith by which we're saved. God does the saving. God does the changing. God does the sanctifying. God does the glorifying. He who began a good work in you will, will bring it to completion in you. He is the beginning. He is the middle. He is the end. He's the God who's saving. All we have to do is believe in him by faith. The following of Christ, the laying our life down, the, the, the overcoming sin, this is not something we do by pulling our bootstraps up. This is something we do by surrendering to Christ. Hear me, if you're a Christian who is struggling in sin or is struggling and falling down and getting up, listen, welcome to Christianity. That's why Paul said you've got to die daily. We've got to acknowledge this daily. But we also have to remember that Jesus is the Savior, not us. And all he wants is our unconditional allegiance and surrender and to follow him because he's Lord. Lord, I just thank you so much for the privilege of proclaiming your word. Lord, the privilege of proclaiming it to so many people. Lord, it's a humble pleasure, God. It's a humble honor. Lord, it's a humble honor when people respond to the gospel and are saved. And it's also a humble honor to be scorned and persecuted for the sake of your name. Lord, I love you and I praise you. I pray that this chasm would become clear to many people. Christians who sort of think there's a such thing as a fence realizes there's no fence to ride there. There's only a chasm. And if you're not in Christ, you're on the other side of it. Lord, I think, I pray that lukewarm people, Lord, complacent people, God, people who are obsessed and addicted to comfort and to self-preservation, God, that they would be drawn to a radical place, Lord, a reckless place, a place that, that, that if, only, if only you are true, that's all that matters, God. Lord, all of our eggs are in that basket, Lord. Lord, if, if you're not true, then we have squandered our lives. But if you are, Lord, we have made the best, the best choice of our life. God, I pray that you give me the fortitude to make that choice each day. God, that you make me like you, God, that I would be able to know you in your resurrection, that I should share in your sufferings. God, that I would have fellowship with you in your death. And that, Lord, in the end, I would be living in resurrected life and power with you as I worship you forever. Lord, let it be true of many others under the sound of my voice. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.